to get to a cross that made peace with God possible, the unveiling of his plan first went through Egypt. Abraham bore Isaac, through Isaac came Jacob, and from Jacob came twelve sons, who would eventually represent the twelve tribes of Israel. Of these twelve sons was Joseph, and because of a self-advancing dream, Joseph drew the jealous ire of his brothers who conspired against him and sold him into slavery to travelers on their way to Egypt. However, Joseph's integrity and faithfulness in God eventually placed him in command of the land of Egypt, the very place where Joseph's father and brothers would eventually live and multiply themselves into a nation over a period of 400 years. However, the rapid growth of the nation of Israel in Egypt soon made Pharaoh terribly uneasy. Good morning, Praise Church family. It's so great to see you this morning, and uh, man, it's fun, it's great uh, to be here, and I get the opportunity uh, to introduce our guest speaker. Uh, his name is Pastor Jeremy Marone, and he's from Houston, Texas, and I couldn't be more excited about the opportunity for us as a church family to hear from him this morning. And I want to tell you two things about Jeremy. He's a friend of mine, a ministry friend of mine as well, and uh, there's two things I know. Number one is he, he is one of the most encouraging people I've ever been around. And I love being around someone who sees the value that God has placed on me and speaks that out. I just genuinely, when I come away from being around Jeremy, I feel like a million bucks. I feel built up. And many times I'm like, man, this is, I just love being around him. And it just shows that he has that heart that God has. Because it's God's heart to make sure you know how valuable you are to him. And so I love that about Pastor Jeremy. But also, he's one of the most intimidating people I've ever been around in my life. Because I'll be hanging out with him. We'll be talking youth ministry and all this sort of cool stuff. And, and he'll be like, yes, uh, the justification of the saints as revealed in Romans chapter 5. And I'll be like, yes, I know that verse from my heart. Yes, I do. And I'm like, I got no clue what you're talking about. Uh, his biblical knowledge is incredible. And I have so much respect for him because he has a passion to know God's word and to make God known. And uh, it inspires me to know more about the Lord. I say intimidating, but it's really inspiring um, how much he loves God uh, and loves to teach God's word. So I know you're in for a treat today. You're going to be uh, encouraged. Hopefully you'll be inspired as well uh, via what God does through Pastor Jeremy this morning. So can we give him a warm Praise Church welcome? Can you help me welcome up Pastor Jeremy Marone, everybody? Thank you. It's, uh, it's good to be here this morning. Um, I get the privilege of being the husband to Tara Marone, used to be Tara Anderud. So I am the uh, son-in-law of Marty and Alan Anderud, and uh, the brother-in-law of Tosh and Tammy, and, and Stephen and Tricia, and uh, all of my nieces and nephews and everything here in Beaumont. And so uh, it, it's, um, I just wanted to, to let you know I do have links here, connections here. Uh, we come here often. Um, we come here over the holidays and, and spend a lot of time. I've known Pastor Reg and Shannon now for 10 years, and um, I've, in the last couple of years, gotten the opportunity to strike up a relationship with Pastor Jimmy. And um, if you don't know Jimmy personally, you got to get to know this guy. Number one, the energy is awesome. Number two, uh, he genuinely cares about people, and he genuinely cares about this young generation. I had the opportunity to minister to junior high and high school students as well. And um, I just want to, I just want to encourage you, if you if you want to sow into the next generation, come connect with this guy and, and support the youth ministry and what they're doing because uh, we want the next generation to know God. Amen? Amen. We're going to, uh, we're going to start very quickly, um, get into our text for today. It's a long text. Um, I'm going to hit on parts of it, um, but I go pretty quickly, so uh, we're going to go ahead and jump into it. Let's pray. Father, we love you. We thank you for who you are. We thank you for all you've done. Lord Jesus, speak to us through your word today. Holy Spirit, just remind us of everything that Jesus has said, all the truth, all the knowledge, everything that he said. Holy Spirit, you said you would lead us into all truth. And Jesus, you said the Holy Spirit would remind us of all of the things that you have said. So remind us today of your word. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to start in Genesis chapter 37. We're talking about Joseph today. Uh, if you don't want to take notes, that's fine. Uh, if you're welcome to take notes if you want to. Um, but the notes will be on um, the Praise Church Facebook page. We have uploaded all of my notes. Thank you to the programming team back here. Appreciate it. Uh, they do such a fantastic job. A lot of times programming booth gets recognized when something goes wrong. So thank you for doing, uh, doing what you do. And uh, for those of you watching online, um, you're welcome to go on uh, Praise Church Facebook page and get the notes. 
So I have a quick question today. Um, thank you to Pastor Reg and Shannon as well. Um, just for inviting us here for Tara and me and my girls, Finley and Foster, to be able to come and be a part this weekend. We're in a series right now called Unveiling the Story of the Bible. And uh, we're going to be talking about the Word of God today, but we're going to be talking about the scope of it. And uh, I've only got about two and a half hours, so we've got to go really fast from Genesis to... No, uh, no the Pro Bowl is on today, so we've got we to gotta get to it. Uh, but, uh, but we're going to start in Genesis... Um, I have a quick question, though. Uh, how many stories are in the Bible? Somebody raise your hand and tell me. How many stories are in the Bible? A lot. A lot. <laughs> Thank you. How many stories? Close. Close. How many stories? Does anybody want to uh, venture a guess? A number, a specific number. One. 64? Close. Who said one? You are correct. The entire Bible is one story of God's people all the way from the beginning of creation until Jesus and then after Jesus, the continuation of his kingdom and the church that he established. So there's one story in the Bible. Now, it's an epic. It's many um, scenes that we have woven in, but the, sto the, the story of the Bible is one singular story from the beginning of humanity until the fulfillment of Jesus Christ, who came to reveal to us what it means to be fully human. Not just what it means to be Christian, but what it means to be fully human in this world, and then to live with God in this world. So, we start with uh, the author of Genesis is, is Moses. He, uh, he was 80 years old when God called Moses to bring the children of Israel out of Egypt. And the, the, the covenant that God gave to Abraham, who was a patriarch, in Genesis chapter 12 and chapter 15, he gave a promise to a man who was a polytheist. He lived in Ur of the Chaldeans. He worshiped many gods. God called him out and he said, I am the I am. I am the true God. And I want you to follow me. I'm going to take you to a land you don't know. And I'm going to make a great nation out of you. I'm going to make your descendants as many as the stars in the sky and as grains of sand on the seashore. And then from there, I'm going to bless the nations of the world through you. So God gives a promise to a man, Abraham. He has a son, Isaac. He has a son, Jacob. He has a 12 sons. One of them is Joseph. So it's the great grandson of Abraham is Joseph. So we can see the story. These books are written, the first five books are written by Moses probably around 1445, 1446 B.C., written by Moses, and it talks about all of the patriarchs. Now, the most time given to the book of Genesis is actually to Joseph. Joseph is mentioned sparingly, basically Acts chapter 7, other than Genesis. He's not mentioned much in the Bible, but he plays a significant role. Now, Abraham, the father of faith, the patriarch, is given a promise from God. Between he and Moses, when Moses takes the children of Israel out of Egypt, even if you've never been in church, most of us have seen the Disney movies, okay? The seas part, people walk through on dry land. From Abraham to Moses, right between them is Joseph. And Joseph's story is very powerful. Now, the book of Genesis is a microcosm. It's a smaller picture of the entire Bible. It starts with the creation of man. Creation of man. John 1.1. 1, 1. Created man. He is the creation. Through him, by him, for him. Colossians 1. The world was created by Jesus, for Jesus, and through Jesus. It was created. And then at the end of Genesis, we see a man who becomes second in command. Now, there's a lot of parallels in the story. First, we're going to talk about the natural lineage of Joseph and why it matters that he was sustained, that, that his part in the story plays such a vital role for the rest of the story of the children of Israel. But also, we're going to tie in some symbolism from the book of Genesis all the way to the person of Jesus Christ. Now, I know we're doing a 15-week series here at Praise Church, and I, I, I'm, I'm very excited to be, to be a part of that. But a 15-week series is over until we get to um, Easter, Passover, and we celebrate the person of Jesus Christ. So we're going to start here with Joseph and talk about what his part is in this, both naturally in the natural line and spiritually. So let's jump in. All right, the most time given to Genesis is the story of Joseph. In Genesis chapter 37, Joseph has 11 brothers, and he has this dream. Now, his father loves him. 
He adores him more than all of his other brothers. He gives him a coat. Many of us know the story of the coat of many colors. He gives him a coat. He treats him a little bit better than his brothers, which makes them angry. The reason he does that is because he was an old man when he had his son Joseph. So he was the joy of his old age. But it made his brothers jealous. So they got angry at Joseph because he was treated differently than they were. So they decided to get rid of him. But they didn't want to kill him. They wanted to get rid of him, but they didn't want to kill him. In Genesis chapter 37, verse 4, if you have your Bible open, it says this, but when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his brothers, they hated him and could not speak peacefully to him. And then in verse 26, then Judah said to his brothers, that's one of the brothers said to his other brothers, what profit is it? What is, how does it help us if we kill our brother and conceal his blood? Come, let us sell him to the Ishmaelites. And let not our hand be upon him, for he is our brother, our own flesh. So immediately right there in Genesis 37, you see a symbol of the person of Jesus Christ. Jesus was sold for 30 pieces of silver by his own brethren, the Jews, to the Romans for the Romans to do what they thought was fit. So Joseph was sold by his brothers to another nation, So they would see what was fit for to pay, to do to his life instead of killing him themselves. So immediately we start to see a parallel with Christ. And his brothers listened to him. Then the Midianite uh, traders passed by and they drew Joseph up out of a well, out of a pit, and lifted him up out of a pit and sold him to the Ishmaelites for 20 shekels of silver. And they took Joseph to Egypt. Now I have a couple of pictures very quickly of the route of the Ishmaelites to meet Joseph's family. Here we see Joseph coming up to meet the Ishmaelites coming from Gilead, and then they take him to Egypt. Now, they take him to a place called Goshen, and Goshen is the northeast side or the eastern side and northern side of Egypt, which is also the delta of the Nile River. You can see right here in this picture, Goshen is where that red dot is, and that is where Joseph went into the land of Egypt. We have one more shot of it. I drew this. No, I'm just kidding. The Goshen's right here. That's the boat they took. No, I'm just kidding. That's not the boat they took. I don't know. They went on animals. But we see the story of Joseph. He goes all the way to Egypt. Now, here's the important part. Is they're not a nation necessarily at this point. God had chosen a family. He chose chosen Abraham's family. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. And then Joseph was Jacob's son. So we get from Abraham to the land of Egypt. And in Egypt is where the children of Israel multiply and they become a nation. 2.1 million of them leave when, with Moses after they're in there for 400 years. So God tells Abraham, I'm going to make you a great nation. You're going to multiply. You're going to have 400 years of being ruled by another nation. And then I'm going to bring you out into the promised land. Now, Joseph was handsome in form. He's in Egypt. They put him in the house of an officer of Pharaoh. In Potiphar's house. They put him in a house with an officer of Pharaoh's military. And his wife decides that she is going to um, try to lure Joseph in to smear his name. He begins having favor with a lot of people in Egypt. He begins having favor in Potiphar's house. And she sees this on him. She also sees that he's attractive. He's good looking. So she goes to tempt him to fall for her and to try to smear his life and his name. When he refuses, when Joseph refuses Potiphar's wife, what she does is she smears his name and says that he came on to me, he pursued me. And so what they did was they took him and put him in prison. Now, this is an important point. If we're talking about Jesus, the entire scriptures, the entire Bible points to the person of Jesus Christ. All the principles, all the stories, all the power, everything points to the culmination of the word of God is the person of Jesus Christ. It is the story of how he became king. God became king so that you and I could live with him in his family, in his kingdom. It is the forgiveness of sin. It is the shedding of blood. It is the resurrection from the dead. It is all of those things. The higher point, though, is that God has become king. And in order for that to happen, Jesus came to us first. He is God with us. And so 
Joseph being put in a pit by his brothers and then being put in prison by the Egyptians is a very important point with Jesus in his story. And we'll get to that in a minute. But Joseph finds favor now with the prison guards. So he's been sold by his brothers. He's been in a pit. He was taken out by another nation. They took him to Egypt. He's now in Egypt. He finds favor. He has his name smeared by an officer's wife. He gets put into prison. And now he starts getting favor with the prison guards. So we see every time that Joseph has something terrible happen in his life, God is faithful to him and actually uses it. And I want to make this point. Wherever you are in your life right now, whatever we go through, whatever we go through in life, God's power and sovereignty over our lives will carry us through. The Bible says Whatever the enemy intends for evil, he intends for God will turn for good. Amen? Amen. So whatever you're walking through right now that is challenging and difficult, God will actually use for your good. So stay in faith. Trust God that he will bring you out. Trust God that he will make a way. And in all things, Jesus is enough in every situation. Amen? Amen. He is enough. And so for Joseph, Joseph got firsthand account that God is enough in that moment. So he's in prison. And he begins to have favor. He starts having favor. And in those days, the patriarchs, they they made a big deal out of of the the spiritual realm. There were, um, in the ancient world, uh, there were gods and there were um, sorcerers and there were people who wanted to tell your, excuse me, your future. So what would happen is, is Pharaoh would bring in his own sorcerers and he would say, what does my dream mean? What does this vision mean? What does this mean? When we see the stars align a certain way, when we see the, the ground give us or not give us you know, product, what does this mean? And they wanted to see because they wanted to see the future. What does all of this mean? They were obsessed in the ancient world with that. And so what he did was he brought Joseph in and um, Joseph had a knack for interpreting dreams. He interpreted two prisoners' dreams because that was important to them in that day. He interpreted two prisoners' dreams, and Pharaoh found out about it, and he said, I have had a dream. I want to know what this dream means. Please bring Joseph in so that I can see through his wisdom what my future will be or our future will be as a nation. I need to know. If Joseph's the one, he, he beat all of his wise counselors. He beat all of his sorcerers. He beat all of his diviners. He beat all of the people in, in interpreting the dreams of the, the prisoners, and now he wants to see it from Joseph for his self, for himself. Genesis chapter 41, verse 38, Pharaoh says this. Pharaoh said to his servants, can we find a man like this in whom is the spirit of God? Now, the cool thing about Joseph, he has wisdom, he has favor with the Egyptians. He has wisdom and he has favor. Everywhere he goes, even though he is in a very tough situation, even though God's uh, providence has brought him to the nation of Egypt, God gives him covering, he gives him wisdom, he gives him uh, favor, he gives him all of the things he needs to be a good steward of the kingdom. So he says this, he says, can we find a man like this? In whom is the spirit of God? Here's what Here's what I'll say. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 1, verse 30, that Jesus is four things to us. Number one, he is our wisdom. Wisdom, he is our redemption, he is our justification, he is our sanctification. Those four things. The first thing, he is our wisdom. In Proverbs, it says the principal thing. Before anything else, gain wisdom. Get understanding and wisdom. And that phrase right there in Proverbs actually is baresit, which is the Hebrew phrase for Genesis 1-1, in the beginning. In the beginning, Jesus is our wisdom. The very first thing to us. He is divine wisdom. Not the logic and rationale of man. He is divine wisdom. So side note, if you have a business in here, if you're a teacher in here, if you're a parent in here and you need wisdom, if you're a student in here and you need wisdom about where to go, if you're in high school and you're trying to pray about where you're going to go to college or what you're going to do after high school, if you need wisdom, Jesus first is to us our wisdom. The Bible says in James 1, 5, ask liberally. That means without stop. Ask for wisdom and God will give you wisdom. If you're in here and you own a business and you need to make a business deal, ask God for wisdom before you go in. Invite him into every single moment. Before you go into a meeting, invite him into that moment. Take 30 seconds and say, God, thank you for your wisdom. I need your wisdom. God gave Joseph wisdom beyond anybody else. And he'll do the same for you. 
You and I can ask and say, Father, thank you for your wisdom. I need your wisdom today. I need your wisdom. Divine revelation. We're not talking about logic. We're talking about divine revelation. Jesus will give us divine revelation on how to make good decisions with our life. And so Joseph had that. And the king, Pharaoh, recognized that the Spirit of God was in him because of that. And so he took Joseph and he elevated him to the second in command in the, in the nation. He took Joseph, the wisdom, the administration, the foresight, he had all of this, the favor that God gave him, and he elevated him. He was put in a terrible situation. He was put in a situation none of us would want to be in, sold by his brothers, put into slavery, accused of his reputation, and God still elevated him to the second in command of the nation. That is the power of God. That is God taking something that was meant for evil and turning it to good. And so we see him second in command. Now, the thing that he interpreted was the sustenance or the sustaining of the world at the time. So what, basically what Joseph told Pharaoh was there is going to be a famine of seven years. Before that famine is going to be seven years of abundance. So he said, in this dream, I see seven years of abundance and then seven years of famine. And then Joseph said, here's what I think we should do. I think we should, in those seven years of abundance, we should take in all the grain that we possibly can and we store it in our storehouses to prepare ourselves for the seven years of famine. Great administrative decision. But the wisdom of God told him, prepare now, prepare now, prepare now. Take it in, prepare. Because the world at the time, by the way, Egypt in scripture is a picture of the world, okay? So the world at the time was coming to Egypt during the famine to get food that only Egypt had. The world was in a famine. And because of God's favor and wisdom on Joseph, he made a good decision and he made Egypt the most powerful nation on the, in the world at that time because of this decision, because of the wisdom. And so people started coming to him. Now, a couple of things in Genesis, in the Genesis record. With this famine is a threat to this covenant line. There is a natural line, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, there is a natural line to continue on all the way to Jesus. So if somebody dies their belief was the covenant would be cut off. So Joseph is the natural line, but he's also the symbolic line, a symbolic foreshadowing of Jesus Christ. So he has to make sure that the, that the covenant can't be cut off because somebody dies. And so the sustaining of Joseph in Egypt is actually the continuation, the unveiling of the Bible from beginning to end is the continuation of the covenant that God made with Abraham that I will make your descendants great. Well, if there's no more descendants because of the famine, then it's over. So what Joseph does is he helps sustain that. So we see the purity of the line continued, the covenant of the line continued. And then later on, as the nations start coming to Egypt, Joseph's brothers show up. And they begin uh, to beg, essentially, for food. And they said, please give us food. Please give us something that will sustain us and our families. And so Joseph recognizes them as his brothers, but they don't recognize Joseph because they hadn't seen him in so long. And so Joseph weeps. There's a moment where he weeps. He cries after his brothers leave the first time he sees them. And he says, come back and I'll make sure that you have what you need. But bring my brother, Benjamin. Bring my father. And then I will help you. So they come back. He reveals himself to his brothers. He reveals himself for who he really is. So Joseph not only is sold into slavery by his brothers, taken to Egypt, his name is smeared, but God takes him and put him, I'm right in the air conditioner, <laughs> takes him and puts him as second in command of the nation, but he has the foresight and wisdom that God gives him to elevate that nation to the greatest nation on the earth so all the world would come to that place to be sustained. The interesting thing about it is this. Colossians 1 says the world was created by Jesus, for Jesus, and through Jesus. And by his hand, all things are sustained. Joseph is a foreshadowing picture of Jesus that he was able to sustain the world at the time and that would be the same for Christ. So he is the fulfillment of the promise multiplied Abraham's seed. Joseph gets into Egypt. He sustains the world by his wisdom and his understanding. And from there, 
the children of Israel begin to multiply. And that's where the nation of Israel begins to multiply over 400 years before they leave with Moses to go into the promised land. And so we see with Joseph, they multiply. They are Abraham's offspring. The Bible says this in Galatians 3.29. If you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. Heirs according to to the promise. Genesis 47 says um, that the children of Israel began to multiply in Egypt. So we have Abraham, the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, and then Joseph helps the children of Israel get into Egypt and they begin to multiply. Now, he went through hardships, but God gave him favor and he gave him wisdom and he gave him administrative help. He became the second in command of the entire nation. The story of Joseph, Joseph is not just the last item in the book of Genesis. The story of Joseph, Joseph is the culmination. And it really has to do with the person of Jesus Christ. Joseph's story is simultaneously a human and a spiritual story. We see the foreshadowing of Jesus and the continuation of the covenant line given to him, the Semitic line, the Jewish line, all the way from Abraham, all the way through to Moses, to the law, to David, all the way through the Davidic line of kings to Jesus, who would be the God King with us. So we see all of this. Now, how does this, how does this tie us to Jesus? A couple of things. Number one, the story of Joseph and the story of Daniel go hand in hand. Okay? They're not tied immediately in Scripture, but they're tied through the foreshadowing. The story of Joseph is he is sold by his own brothers into slavery, into a pit. He's put in a pit and sold to the Ishmaelites to go into slavery in Egypt. And from there, from the pit, he is raised up to second in command, the right hand of Pharaoh. Same story with Daniel. In the book of Daniel, a young Jewish boy in Babylon, in captivity with King Nebuchadnezzar, he was put in a lion's den because he would not worship the gods of Nebuchadnezzar or him as king. So he would not go against his own god, that's Adonai, Yahweh, the God of the Jewish people. Daniel would not go against. Joseph worshipped his God. Daniel worshipped the same God. Daniel was put into a lion's den. In the, the picture of lions in Scripture is a picture of the kings of the world. Psalm chapter 22. The kings of the world that are roaring against the God king. That's Jesus. He was elevated in Babylon. Daniel, in the book of Daniel, was elevated to the second in command under Nebuchadnezzar. The same exact situation that happens here with Joseph happens to Daniel. In both situations, you have somebody who's put in a pit, they are lowered, and then raised. Jesus came, Philippians 2, to us, to the earth. He was lowered to us. He came as a human, as a man, and was raised to the right hand of the Father. That is the picture of Jesus. So Joseph, his story, not only does he continue the covenant line, the seed of Abraham, the covenant line all the way through. But then we see the picture symbolically of the person of Jesus Christ who came as the God King to set you and I free. To be free. To be forgiven of all sin. To have righteousness with God. Because of Jesus. In the very last verse of Genesis chapter 50, it says this. So Joseph died being 110 years old. They embalmed him and they put him in a coffin in Egypt. They put him in a coffin in Egypt. In Psalm 132, it says this, Remember, O Lord, in David's favor, all the hardships he endured, how he swore to the Lord and vowed to the mighty one of Jacob, I will not enter my house or get into my bed. I will not give sleep to my eyes or slumber to my eyelids until I find a place for the Lord a dwelling place for the mighty one of Jacob. Behold, we heard it in Emprata, which is Bethlehem, the birthplace of both David and our Savior. Behold, we heard of it in Bethlehem. We found it in the fields of Jaar. Let us go to this dwelling place. Let us worship at his footstool. Arise, O Lord, and go to your resting place, you and the ark of your might. In some translations, it may say the ark of your strength. Why is this important, and what does it have to do with Genesis chapter 50, the very last verse with Joseph? The Hebrew word here in Psalm 132, the ark, is the word Aron, A-R-O-N. If you're taking notes, Aron. The Hebrew word there is the same as coffin 
in the very last verse of Genesis. The only place in scripture it's, it's translated in the Hebrew as coffin is Genesis 50. Here, as in every other place that that word is used, it's used as a box, the Ark of the Covenant, the Ark of the, the presence of God that was given to the children of Israel for the tabernacle, and then later on the temple. What does that have to do with anything? Well, there's three things in the Ark. There's the manna that God provided for the children of Israel in the desert. There's Aaron's rod that budded, which signifies God's authority. And number three, there's the stone tablets of God's law. On top of it is the angels, the cherubim. And it's the mercy seat of Jesus. So the point to it is this. The word that they use there for Joseph is coffin. Something that has died. So if those three things have died, you have one, Jesus sits on top of that mercy seat. Now, we no longer use the Ark of the Covenant as the symbolic picture of the presence of God. That's the Holy Spirit. The presence of God here. Jesus came and then sent us the Holy Spirit. Now, on top of the Ark is the mercy seat where Jesus sits. And they would kill an animal and sprinkle the top of it with their blood to forgive the nation of their sins. But that word they use is coffin. That means something has died. That means Jesus put to death our grumbling and complaining of his provision. Jesus put to death our um, frustration with his God-given authority of Moses and Aaron. And Jesus put to death our breaking of his holy law. Jesus put to death all of those things that you and I might have life. And they say it with Joseph. The very last verse of his story is Jesus has put to death the things that you and I were against God, he put to death so that we might have life. Amen? So we see how Joseph is tied in. We see how Joseph naturally is tied into the covenant line, but also spiritually points to the person of Jesus Christ. And now the mercy seat has been sprinkled with the blood of Jesus once for all, that all who put their faith in Yeshua, the Mashiach, Messiah, everybody that puts their faith in Jesus will not be ashamed, but will be raised in the last day to be with him forever in the kingdom of God. So we see the story, even though it's a very hard, difficult story for Joseph, it was the providential story of God that brought him through so that the children of Israel, their story could continue to Moses and then Moses bringing them out into the promised land. That is the picture for us. So Joseph's life is a picture of the continuation of the covenant line and the foreshadowing of our Savior who has come to give us life. And if you don't know that Savior today, I would encourage you, put your faith in Jesus Christ today. The Bible says that he is everything to us. He is our salvation. Not only is he our salvation, he is your wisdom today. He is your redemption today. He is your sanctification today. He is your righteousness before God. If you need wisdom today, if you need, if you need God to speak to you today, I would encourage you to go to, the, go to him this week. Ask him for wisdom. Ask him for direction. Ask him that he would move on your behalf. What the enemy intends for evil, God will turn for good. Amen? He will turn for good. If you need help in your marriage, if you need help in your family, if you need help raising your children, if you need help in your business, if you, if you are struggling with fear or depression today, I would encourage you, go to the Lord Jesus Christ. He has given us all things by his power. He has sustained us by his power that through him and by him and for him, all things should be sustained by his hand. And so for you and I, we have the opportunity to go to our Savior who has given us all things that we need that pertain to life, and godliness. First Peter 5. Life and godliness. Everything that pertains to that. If you need wisdom in Jesus today, just like Joseph, go to the Lord and ask. James 1.5 says, ask liberally, without end. Continue to ask God. His favorite thing to do is to give you wisdom and direction when you need it. And he proves it in the story of Joseph. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we love you today. We thank you for your son, Jesus. We thank you for the story of Joseph, how we can see that even though we go through difficult things, that you are with us. You said you are Emmanuel. You are God with us. And thank you that you not only are with us, but you give us everything that we need, including wisdom. So Father, speak to us today. Father, draw us in by your Holy Spirit. Remind us of everything that you've said to us today. Remind us of everything that you've said, Lord Jesus. Lead us into all truth and we will follow. 
Father, thank you for the Mashiach Messiah who has come to be our everything. He has come to be our sacrifice once and for all. That, Father, we are righteous before you. Thank you. We are your children and we are in your family because we are of the line of Abraham. The renewed covenant in you. In Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. Thank you so much.